okay so uh, welcome today we are going to take what five more questions today uh, hopefully within the time limit so uh, the questions that uh, i already shared the pdf uh, with you uh, of today also or yesterday's also but let's see the questions one by one uh, in the class itself for uh, bringing the synchronization with all the students so a uh, well written questions we have been uh, discussing and showing it to the students so that they also get the confidence that the things that they miss in their own writings can be added up so now for example now this is a question on sangam literature what is meant by sangam literature give an account of south india as covered by it so sangam literature and it's a 250 word question so 250 word question so first of all we have to define what is the meaning of sangam literature in the introduction so sangam literature refers to a great body of tamil literature which got compiled in assemblies so assembly means sangam sangam is people meeting together and what this sangam is all about who met for that sangam tamil poets yes so tamil poets convened under the royal patronage of kings now the sangam literature gives a detailed account of the late megalithic cultures in the cheras cholas and the pandyas okay from a time period around what 800 800 bc to what 800 yes uh, 300 sorry 300 bce now sorry uh, ce sorry also called as the sangam age now account of the south india now what this sangam age tells about the entire south india in different uh, context the political economic social so here is properly mentioned now so first of all starting with what account of south india with respect to polity and administration so logically also we also should be writing first the polity and administration first then economy then society so this should be, should be the flow then art and culture so polity and administration <clears throat> so first of all clearly with the bullet point is saying that form of government is hereditary monarchy now there were now we are talking about three dynasties here chera cholas and pandyas so now mentioning about all the three were hereditary monarchy now what were their symbols so royal emblems so bow is for cheras tiger for cholas and fish for pandyas <clears throat> now hence the king was called as co assisted by council of ministers so again all the council ministers are being properly told yes the name and the meaning the portfolio they were symbolizing so amaichar was the minister anthanar was the priest okay tutar was the envoys sinapati the commander orar was the spies that means the names and their meaning what they were looking forward uh, what they were looking what were their responsibilities during the sangam age now sources of the state in income so land revenue custom duties and also booty captured in wars very important because the wars were conducted to capture more treasury so what we are seeing is a sequence again sequence is well laid out here introduction defining what is meant by sangam literature sangam means assembly assembly of whom poets under whom kings now period have been mentioned polity and administration now society so brahmans function as poets rewarded by kings consumption of meat and wine was common social stratification so varna system was known but not strictly adhered to so it was a beginning of the influence of brahmanism in the south india so four categories of functional classification now arasa the royal class anthanar the priestly class vanigars the trading class and vilalas the peasants that means again the classification of society the class stratification of the society also coming into picture so there was a varna system accordingly the division of the classes also happening but they were not very strict in terms of uh, the caste system which originated later now material alliances could be seen between <coughs> the arasa and the vilalas means it was common it was common that two different classes people were also marrying so that means it was still fluid in nature it was not very strict social inequality so rich were living in what brick and mortar houses again stratification is visible in the times of the residence or the accommodations and poor lived in what mud houses now position of women so there were certain differences uh, some was positive and there was also creeping up of certain what maybe uh, disadvantages let's see 
so women were educated so some of the women were educated not the entire set of women were educated but there were examples of some educated women so there were poets avainar yes now love marriage was allowed so that means there's a more openness in terms of choosing your life partners choosing your life partners now some disadvantages uh, things emerging there is prevalence of practice of sati miserable life of widows so what we are seeing is some positive and some negatives <clears throat> so religion the chief god was murugan and the kings performed vedic sacrifices now what we are seeing sangam period was the age in which the compilation of what various literature happened under the under the command of various kings under by done by various poets this is a period of the influence of the emergence of brahmanical system in the uh, southern india now the stratification had started but there was no prominent rigid caste system still the things are little fluid because the things had yet to take shape with respect to the rigidity which happened over a period of time now similarly status of women some positive some negative <clears throat> religion chief god murugan kings performed vedic sacrifices but there were also reference of buddhism jainism hinduism and and other cults <clears throat> Now, when we talk about economy, so economy uh, there was five uh, geographical regions divided economically. So, Purunji was the hilly tracts, Mullai was the pastoral, Marudam was agriculture, Nethal was coastal, and Palai arid. That means so land was classified on the basis of productivity and the usage usage patterns. So, Purunji hilly that means on hills hunting can be more possibility. Pastoral means animal husbandry, cattle rearing. now marudam is agriculture so agriculture coastal areas definitely oceans means sea means fishing and arid means raid and plunder that means very less things which are going to be what produced to hence scarcity leading to what plunder raid <coughs> now trade with romans means now we are talking about the external trade so accounts paraplus of erathrency natural history by pliny and roman coins these were the sources mentioning about the trade with the Uh, with the Romans, yes, the outsiders, and hence the ports, the ports, Muzirus, Korkai, Pohar, yes. So a, a map would have been added. Okay, so a, a map would have been added here. So a map, definitely, when some location has to be shown, always remember try to add a map. Yes. <coughs> Now, hence Sangam literature gave yes account of South Indian history, which helped in establishing links of the far south and north. and hence emerged as source for settling chronology and achievements of various kingdoms and empires so that means it was a time period where we can connect with the emergence of a regular history in the southern india and its association also with the northern part of the country so that means it's a very important time period so that means the question had got every possible feature more or less one more thing would have been added certain maps would have been added here <coughs> Or even the Chola Chela Pandyas territory, when the, what has been mentioned, their emblems would have been mentioned. So the locations would also have been shown yes, in a map. <coughs> Now let's take this question. Uh, describe the administrative reforms of Sher Shah. What steps did he adopt to promote the growth of trade and commerce? So here again the keywords already underlined uh, by the person who has written this administrative reforms underlined. here we are talking about sher shah steps promote what trade and commerce so hence we have to introduce sher shah first so sher shah sorry was the founder of the sur dynasty he was the son of the uh, the sasaram jagirdar hasan khan yes. okay so a line would also be had been added yes here the sher shah the sher shah tenure was of this interregnum yes between what the moguls yes that means between humayun and akbar that means he filled the gap yes he filled the gap the sur dynasty filled the gap and in that sur dynasty of around what 15 years 5 years uh, was of sher shah period so again uh, the linkages would have been shown the linkages not simply mentioning sher shah how he emerged he emerged after what humayun that is defeating humayun and finally laid the foundation of a sur dynasty which filled the gap between the reemergence of mughal empire under akbar yes under akbar okay. 
Now, hence, Empire of Sheshasuri. So, a uh, rough location has been shown. Good. So, Northern India majorly. So, map. Now, so, so what were the first key points? Administrative reform. So, hence, starting with the administrative reform. So, yes, a flowchart, civil flowchart. So, empire divided into sarkar, sarkar into parganas, parganas into villages. So, he divided the empire into 47 sarkars and subdivided into parganas. Now, he established four main central departments. That means now the portfolios. So, Vizarat, Finance, Arts, Military, Insha, Royal Secretariat, now Diwani Risalat, Religious and Foreign Affairs. That means division. Now, similarly, this is the central level. Now, let us see at the Sarkar level. As Sarkar, he appointed officers to maintain law and order and to supervise the revenue connection. Pargana. <coughs> so, three major divisions, Shikdar, Amin and Munsif. So, here the administrative division. Showing the steps taken to settle down a uh, what proper administration. Now, hence other reforms like coinage introduced silver coin, rupiah yes, and copper coin, dam. Now, communication system introduced regular postal service and constructed GT road yes, okay, from Sunargaon to Peshawar. Yes. Again, uh, maybe a rough map would have been added, especially mentioning about the GT road. Uh, a GT road. Now, revenue policy. So, cultivable land was classified into three classes, good, middle and bad. One third of the average was paid both in cash and kind. Yes. So, method of what? Revenue collection, both cash and kind. Now, one thing would have been added yet that the, uh, that the Raja Todormal, which who became famous during the time of Akbar, yes, was basically lived in the time period of Shesha Shuri, was the initiator of these reforms. Raja Todorbal, the name would have been added here. Because Raja Todorbal's experience of working in Shesha ultimately helped Akbar. Now, trade and commerce. Now, built roads and sarais to improve trade. The duty of protecting merchants was given to zamidar or village headmen. So, focusing on what the movement of the people, the especially the traders from one place to another, hence giving emphasis on their security. So, introduced coins of gold, silver and copper of uniform standard. Restructured the police system to reduce crimes and introduced new weights and measures. That means, it's taking the, first of all, standardization of weights and measures, security, okay, safe movement, Special policing system, all these were the contributions to promote trade and commerce. And Shesha's administrative reforms became the model for the later Mughals like Akbar to provide better service to people. The introduction of rupiah has been uh, using a currency uh, that has been preserved, uh, the rupiah, the name has been preserved till date by the Indian government. Yes, that was the contribution. Now, here, <coughs> Sarai's. Maybe the distance would have also be added. Okay, at what intervals the rise was there? Maybe little more factual information would have been added, or two course or a char course, what whatever the division was there. Means again, uh, the intervals would have been mentioned here, the location. So majorly, many things were there. One or two maps would have been added, and one or two additional information like the Raja Todormal or the time period of the Shesha was between. Uh, which person and which person would have been added. That would have been given a completion to this answer. Yes. <coughs> okay, now when you talk about Lord Wellesley, so discuss the underlying factors okay, of Lord Wellesley's policy expansion. What are the basic methods he used to achieve his aims? Okay. So, Wellesley's policies of expansion and his methods. So, Wellesley, policy of expansion and the methods that he used. Now, Lord Wellesley served as the Governor General from time period 1798 to 1805. So, time period has been mentioned. He pursued a policy of territorial expansion and consolidation in India. Okay? But one additional information would have been added here. For example, 
Now we know in 1793 the company East India Company got the extension of 20 year trade monopoly in India. That means trade monopoly in India means it, it was the, the Britishers were liking the expansion of the territory, territory via East India Company. So that 20 year monopoly coincided with yes, the tenure of Lord Wellesley also. So hence Lord Wellesley utilized the 20 year monopoly for what faster expansion. Okay. So that information would have been added here. Yes. So information would be East India Company got 20 years monopoly in 1793 AD. And this coincided with the tenure of Wellesley. So he used His time in laying strategy for expansion. Yes, that means he utilized it. Yes, already, already the mandate was there to the company to expand, and that mandate was utilized by the Wellesley to the fullest extent. So that means a additional one liner would have been added, yes. connecting with the policy of the British government, which is which gave the monopoly of twenty years. Now, underlying factors and forces, so why he followed the expansionist policy or the other factors? One factor was the geopolitical situation. The rising influence of French in India made him to establish British supremacy, eliminating them from India. That means there was a global concerns. Yes, that means there was a global tussle going on right from the European continent to other colonial world and also to India between English and French. So this became important to at least Aust French from India. Now, economic interests. Growing industrialization in England arose the demand for raw material like cotton. Thus, he decided to control key regions like Deccan, Calcutta, UP, and Malabar. Yes. So that means raw material, demand for raw material due to what increased industrialization in UK. So India became the source for various raw materials. <coughs> Security. Now, potential threat for Marathas, Tibu Sultan made him to take preventive actions like strengthening company's army and agreements with local rulers. So, hence he used various methods. One of the methods you all know is subsidiary lines. Now, mediation, military campaigns, diplomacy and treaties, legislations. So, he used to multiple methods. Now, subsidy lines was uh, most well known. So, this system made local rulers compelled to accept the stationing of British army in their territory by paying subsidy for its maintenance. In return, the rural of the, uh, rural of the kingdom was promised to protect the state from external threats. In return, rural was promised, the Britishers promised the ruler to protect the state. It barred native rulers to negotiate or have trade relations with other European except British. That means the conditions were, first of all, the conditions which were favorable were first, a uh, 20 year monopoly which gave the full uh, power in the hand of uh, the governor general like Wellesley to expand as much as possible. Geopolitical conditions uh, were becoming demanding so as to compete against the French and completely force them out. Now, the security conditions means various Indian kingdoms, they have to be what uh, countered. Now, hence it requires what policy, expansionist policy that included various methods. One of the methods was subsidy lines. Now, mediation on the grounds of the maladministration, Wellesley took over territories like Tanjore and Sura, so they were annexed. Military campaigns, he engaged in the fourth anglo mesur war. Resulted in a defeat and death of Tipu. He took control of Mysore. Also, during this time period, was Second Anglo Maratha War, Treaty of Basin, and he expanded control over Konkan region and Maratha territories. Legislations. Now, very important legislation was the Press Act. So, censorship of Press Act in 1799 to control the message against the Britishers spread by the French. To prevent the French from publishing anything that could harm the British in any way, that is, which could harm the British reputation in any way. So, he brought what press it. This is an additional point which has been added. This is a very good point.
which have been added here okay? because this was also not in my mind yes when i was thinking about this question but this point has been added this is very good and we have covered all this in the content itself yes this there in the content itself so here just rely on the content revise the content as much as possible because the information can be beneficial for both mcqs as well as the main answer writing nothing else is required so one standard book establishment of what again consolidation is strategic location fort william college he made first attempt to uh, what uh, train civil servants locally he planned to teach oriental culture law tradition so that they could better coordinate in governance centralization of administration and focus on improving naval force and control coastal areas that means he had done enormous thing which was very strategic very planned and he executed them well which led to the expansion of the british empire during his time period thus wellesley pursued an aggressive policy with native rulers and were largely successful in his goal of establishing the company as a supreme power in india so hence again everything has been there in the question every every basic to advanced detail so all these become the simple answers yes simple draft answers which are very good so whenever you are writing on any additional issues try to compare yes are you missing some points are you uh, including all the points basic points major points let's compile the answers <coughs> now now this is more easy question yes but again it has to be written not only factually but also in terms of what interpretation well so for example trace the evolution of east india company not only east india company's evolution but east india company's what focus it is relations it's not the evolution of east india company it's the east india company's relations with the british state yes so east india company was operating in india and the british state was trying to control the operation of the east india company from britain so what were their relations during the expansion of east india company from the period 1765 that is after battle of baksar till 1833 yes that till the coming of the law commission till the coming of the first governor general of india 1833 Now bring out the major factors which influence these relations. Again, a two fifty words answer. So again, starting with a good introduction, India was under the company's rule till eighteen fifty eight. Now British government first intervened in seventeen sixty seven. Now why the British government intervened? Because after the Battle of Baksar, so East India Company had got huge now territories under control, enormous riches under control. and that means there were huge what corruption emerging in the east india company so this required certain what control over the uh, functioning of the east india company in india 1767 demanding 10% of the plunders in india so now the british government demanded whatever you are earning so give us first of all 10% the period from 1765 to 1833 see saw gradual increase in the crown control and reducing company's control so crown control was increasing and company's controls was getting reduced so this is a very important line yes so one line actually gave the crux of the answer okay it saw the expansion of british control and reduction of the company's control so hence let's see in what way the relationship uh, evolved and finally uh, changed over a period of time So evolution of relations between company and the crown between 1765 to 1833. So in 1773, first of all, Regulating Act was passed in British Parliament to check corruption in the company. So it was the first major act to bring regulation. So it introduced a centralized administration, a supreme court, and control over Indian affairs in the hands of British cabinet. Now after this. Pitt's in the Act of 1874 introduced Board of Control. Board of Control. Then the Charter Act of 1793 made it necessary to get a royal mandate for appointing the Governor General, Governors and Commander in Chief. So gradually, what happened to appoint the Governor General? Okay, or the Governors of the provinces, and even the Commander in Chief. So approval was required. Hence, control was increasing. and the significant was move was to 
pay the salaries of the home government officials using revenues from it. Now further, Charter Act of 1830 ended the monopoly. So hence now, when the expansion through the East India Company already taken place, now the time has come to control the company. So hence the Act of 1813 uh, uh, ended the monopoly of the company except for trade with China and the trade in tea. In this act, the constitution position of the British territories in India was explicitly defined for the first time. That means these are a territory of the British crown for the first time. Now further, Charter Act of 1833 completely ended the monopoly of company and now the territories were governed in the name of the crown only. Now, that means what we are seeing, company becoming powerful, misusing the power, finally regulation, control, expansion via company and then keeping a control of the company to reduce its uh, what, uh, what extreme power because it cannot be standing parallel to the British crown for the factors influencing the relations. Now, first of all, the Treaty of Allahabad 1765 gave unchecked powers to the company. They established a dual government in Bengal with a company devoid of responsibilities. So this resulted in rampant corruption leading to the bankruptcy of and the company while its servants became richer. So first of all, these factors influenced the changes in the acts and the, what the acts prompted or promoted. So first of all, corruption after Treaty of Allahabad. Till 1813, it was an era of mercantilism with industrial revolution in Europe and the idea of free trade emerged. So we know when the idea of free trade emerged, so what happens, so, so more companies in the United Kingdom demanded the uh, uh, demanded the monopoly of Eastern economy should be ending in India. We should also be giving the chance to operate in India, not only East India company. So hence because to promote the concept of free trade. So this, this was also one of the reasons to control the monopoly of the East India company. So till 1830, it was an era of mercantilism. With industrial revolution in Europe and the idea of free trade was formed to be beneficial for the capitalist. Hence, the monopoly of the East India Company was gradually taken away. So, there are various reasons. Yes, reasons, reasons relationship, starting corruption, then the British Parliament wanted to use or the British Crown wanted to use this for its own uh, a benefit for expansion of territories. Territories expanded, now control it. One of the reasons for controlling it also promotion of free trade. The demand for free trade. Now, the relationship between the Eastern Company and the British state changed over time and reached a point where Crown had to take over following the revolts of 1857. Until then, the relation suited the capitalist class in Britain. Yes. Okay. So, actually, it was used as a tool for its own benefit. So, this was the answer, all the features. Now, so uh, without taking too, too much time, uh, so let us uh, resume the polity part now. So uh, discussions, so uh, we will continue with discussions uh, uh, tomorrow also and day after tomorrow also. And then uh, on Monday onwards, some MCQs uh, will be taken over for next week for discussion. Okay. So it will be rotated in different manner. Un unconventional questions uh, will be introduced in between. So thank you. So 